downtown Burbank, we are getting ready to praise the Lord with all our might. Why is that? Because he has saved us, he loves us, and he's coming to deal with us today and make him more and more like, make us more and more like him. So Lord, we ask for your blessing upon the worship team, all those that come today, those that are watching. We ask above all things, Lord, that we would be drawn more directly to you in a face-to-face -face relationship to be changed by the glory that comes off of your face. Lord, bless your kids today. Open up the eyes of our heart in a new way to know you and love you. Bless the worship team and everyone here. Amen. Beloved, I know how weary you are and tired and bruised by what's been going on. But know this, all of heaven is with you and the cloud of witnesses are urging you on, saying, go, go, we're behind you. And I, I am with you in everything. So don't look at what's going on. Look to me, for I am your answer. Yeah. You know, I just feel like this goes. I had it. So, Lord, I just thank you. He says the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. The path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. And as the storm darkens the earth, you will shine brighter and brighter. And I want to encourage you that I am opening up your spiritual senses in new ways. I am opening up the eyes of your heart. I am opening up your uh, sensitivity to the angelic realm. And I am giving you sight. I'm giving you dreams. I'm going to increase the visions because you will walk in light. I want you in light. So mix what I say with faith and receive receive the light that I am bringing in this hour for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom thank you Lord and so Lord we just receive Lord we an increased sensitivity to the spiritual realm an increased opening of the eyes of our heart Lord we just receive this an increased sensitivity to the moving of the angelic, to pictures, to impressions, to prophetic words, Lord, to dreams. And we receive those and say, thank you, Father. It's your good pleasure to give them freely to us. Amen.
such a privilege, Lord, to love you and worship you. To give our hearts to you afresh so that you can move in deeper into us. We just love you and bless you. We thank you, Lord. I just want to say thank you to Andre and Diana and the team. The songs you picked, my message, which is going to be a little shorter than usual today, but it's we need to look more directly at Jesus. And those songs did that. It's pretty, uh, pretty wonderful and amazing. So thank you very much. And thank you, choir, for singing so beautifully as you always do. <laughs> Amen. Do you want to come up now? It is uh, such a privilege to be able to speak to all of you. Um, one of the ways that the Lord speaks to me is sometimes he literally drops something in my path that is meant to be a message. Um, actually, a year ago in February of 2020, he did that. When I was walking my normal walk in the neighborhood, I would go through the park and there was this toy gun you can't really see it too well, but it's like a serious gun. This is like a combat gun. And I remember passing by it a few times, and then the Lord's like, that's for you. Like, there's no kid coming to retrieve that gun. That's for you. So I took it home, and I'm like, hmm, what does this mean? Two days later, Bishop Bill Heyman published his 2020 Word of the Lord, and he said, the harvesters must be equipped with God's World War III weapons of Holy Spirit supernatural manifestation. You can't expect to win without the modern technology and weapons of warfare today. We are getting new weapons and we're moving into new dimensions of God. So that was a year ago. This week, I was doing my normal walk and I saw this little army man laying face down in the dirt, little army figure. But he wasn't the usual camouflage green or even gray. He's the color of dry bones, and he was laying face down in the dirt. And, oh, besides that, um, his weapon is severed, like the, the gun, the shooting end of the weapon is severed. He's missing his left hand. He's missing both feet. And his head is almost severed from his body. It's like barely hanging on by a little bit of flesh. So I asked the Lord, what did he want to say about that? And he said, and this is for the body of Christ. I don't want anybody to take it as this is a word for this church. Okay, this is for the body of Christ. I have many fallen soldiers, many wounded warriors who need to be revived and restored to my body. They have nearly lost connection to the head, which is one reason why in this church, Week after week after week, our pastors are making sure that we are connected to the head. Some fell because their weapons were useless. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, spoken in faith, as inspired by my spirit, is the weapon my son used and the weapon I've given you. Yet his, it has grown dull in the hands of even my officers. Two, my body is short-handed. Nehemiah and his builders understood that one hand holds the weapon and the other hand does the work. Their enemies tried to frighten them so their hands would get too weak for the work. But Nehemiah prayed, strengthen my hands. It's my hands that do the work of rebuilding. It's my hands that reach out to others feeding, serving, blessing, healing, teaching. The gift of helps is needed and in short supply. 
and by rejecting the left hand of my body, those you deem too liberal, you cut off the hand that is currently most doing most of the feeding of the poor and welcoming sinners, making sinners feel welcome. My church has had its feet blown off. How can you stand your ground without feet firmly planted in faith? Who is willing to stand immovable after you have done everything and nothing has visibly changed? Stand your ground. Stand. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, and who say to Zion, your God reigns. I need an army, a standing army, who I can send. I am not rebuking you. I am revealing my heart to you. I am giving you my perspective, and I am commanding you, as I did Ezekiel, to change these things, you prophesy. Prophesy. To prophesy is to speak a specific thing that is determined to happen in the future. You prophesy. You say to these bones, live. You say to these bones, hear the word of the Lord. I want more. I expect more. I have more. I have more than a remnant in this nation. I have a vast army, a vast army I mean to send into the rest of the world. So Lord, we speak from your heart to your body. This, the Lord says, live. The Lord says, I am putting my breath in you in every part of you, and I am commanding you to stand a vast and mighty army. In Jesus' name, keep on prophesying. Amen. Do we have uh, some announcements there? Well, um, you can put up the information for the offering. Isn't it wonderful the different ways the Lord speaks to us? She picks up those things on her walk, the little different things, the figurines. I've been, been blessed to hear some of that when that balloon came down into your backyard, too. I can't remember the uh, thing around it. But this is so neat. Heaven is all around us, speaking Amen. to us. So I'm very encouraged. The word, what he's saying to us is... Uh, of course, through Janet, to be strengthened and encouraged to look away from the difficult, to keep our eyes on him, connected to the head, like Tammy said. And then he's saying to us, I'm going to increase your sensitivity to the spirit realm. Amen. I'm the path, he, he just kept saying it to me, the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. It doesn't stay the same. It's not status quo, it's growing brighter and brighter with every step of the way. So it's such a blessing that he is um, opening our eyes. And it's the Father's good pleasure. The Father delights in giving us the kingdom. So thank you so much. I just feel he wants to emphasize the variety of our personalities, how we hear, what he's saying. He loves, I mean, every single one of us, no one has our fingerprint. And then every snowflake is different. This is a little radical here, but that's how much he loves diversity, not conformity. It's diversity, free to become more and more who we really are. So anyway, just wanted to mention uh, that we are going to have corporate prayer next Sunday from uh, 12, 15 to 1. We're uh, doing that once a month again. It's just we feel that the Lord really wants emphasis at this point, too, on fellowship and getting to know one another. So uh, Raylene will be announcing that down the line. But Mark 
March 21st on your calendars. That's a Sunday. We're going to have a lunch again like we did at Christmas. We just thought that was such a blessing, and uh, Raylene has got that all planned, so we'll be announcing the details. But he, it's about family. You know, I s spent the week, two days, in Corona del Mar with my daughter, Laura, our daughter, Laura, with her, you know, 15-month-old Charlotte, and then Duke, who is uh, a month today, oh, Duke Holden, uh, because Daddy, Drew Holden, was away on business, and then we went, I met Rick, he came, and we drove on down to Carlsbad and spent the next three days with our, two days, yeah, two two days. days yeah. yeah, well, yeah with our older ki our, our oldest daughter, her family, and our son Joseph who lives with them. So family is a big deal, as you well know, and he takes the solitary and puts them in families, in bodies, in churches. So praise the Lord. Okay, just want to, uh, uh, Marnie, do you want to come up? We've got a tremendous opportunity here, and it's been in the announcements, but we, we, we have not said it from the pulpit. So we just wanted to make that known. Yes, uh, a dear friend of Rob's and mine, her name is Janet Mangum, has done a great deal of deliverance. She learned deliverance by experience, not out of a book, but she does teach out of books too. And she's offering um, Zoom training in deliverance, which can be for yourself or it can be for helping other people or both. And it's going to start uh, this Thursday She's offering it at um, 11 on Thursday morning or 6 at Thursday night. And because <clears throat> there's been so much interest, she's added a Saturday 8 a.m., another Zoom for, for those if that's a better time slot for you. There will be a book that you need to order um, called Set Yourself Free. Um, the, there'll be discussion of the chapters and then sharing th from Janet and from other people who have experienced personally. So go to the announcements, get her contact information because you need to let her know so she can give you the Zoom information. I, I would also you. say Janet is a friend of ours too, Pam and I. We love her dearly and she is amazing. She has been the International Director of Evangelism for Women's Aglow. She is wonderful. That's all I can tell you. Very so dynamic. You're blessed to uh, have yeah. her, really. She's I mean, offering this amazing. free. It'll be every Thursday for how many weeks? Seven or eight weeks. Yeah. Or every Saturday morning yeah. for seven or eight weeks. So uh, just hope you've seen that and are aware of that and can get the uh, uh, details from her. Okay, great. Did you guys put up the information for the giving? I don't know. Did you? Well, okay, well. Put it up there while I'm talking about it briefly. And uh, I want to talk briefly today what, what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about two major issues, humility and agape love, which is self-sacrificial by nature. So, Lord, I just pray that you bless the people. Thank you for those who have been giving. Thank you for watching over your children. Thank you for causing us, in Jesus' name, to give to you, Lord, to receive from you, and thank you with no pressure. We thank you for blessing the people today. Amen. So you can leave that up for a little bit if they need it. If you're going to write a check, TGP for short, The Gathering Place, TGP for short. There's envelopes in front of you. Uh, and if you haven't given before and you're giving by credit card, please leave a phone number. That would be great. And, of course, people are giving online and, and so forth. Um, this week I, um, I uh, was praying and are just really waiting before the Lord, quietly, sort of. And uh, it came to me, um, you need to more directly focus on me. And it's like this, it's like, when you repent, if the Lord is over there and you repent, we're turning to the Lord, right? And then we turn more and more, but he's looking for a face-to-face -face relationship. That's what I am teaching you today. I'm going to tell you how what two me mega elements, they may be the most important in Scripture, of how to have a face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus, God the Father, the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you exactly how, exactly how the Lord taught it in uh, just a minute. So I want you to know that. I want you to know where we're going. Now, le not yesterday, but the Saturday before, I don't know if she's here today, uh, Martha... Raise your hand if you're here. Maybe not. Anyway, she's incredibly um, sweet. She's been in the church maybe a year and a half, two years. And um, 
Oh, you're up there? Oh my gosh, okay. Well, anyway, Martha, I love you dearly. And we were praying uh, uh, last Saturday, and um, I'll just say this openly. Martha is humble and very childlike. So as she began to pray, we can put up Ephesians in a minute, uh, 526. As she began to pray, very precious before the Lord, there were 25, 30 of us on that prayer uh, Zoom call, and um, this is what began to happen. Oh, not that. Okay. It'll be up in a minute. <laughs> Everybody, money fell out of the sky. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, in Ephesians 5.26, I'll tell you what happened. So she begins to pray very humbly. And all of a sudden, I thought, oh, I know exactly what he's doing. He's washing us in the water of the word. Without me saying anything, people begin to read scripture. And this is exactly what happened. This is what he does to his bride. But I experienced it like rain. I thought, okay, you're raining the word of God and you're washing us by the water of the word. That's what happened to us. It happens more when, uh, not more, but it happens when I wait on the Lord and then the Holy Spirit gives me scriptures and he washes me and causes me to have more of a pure heart to see and understand what he's saying. It's a supernatural thing. I'm talking about supernatural dynamics between you and God alone. Nothing, we need pastors, we need friends, we need prayer groups and all that. But he says he makes her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Remember, Jesus told the disciples, he says, you have been pruned or you've been, you know, cut back a little bit by the word I've spoken to you. That's another issue of the word of God. But in humility, humility is what gives you access to the gospel. We'll go to um, uh, uh, Isaiah 61, 1. Jesus tells us that the gospel, listen carefully, is only for the humble. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And the degree of humility that you have within you, uh, I'll explain how you get humility, but humility is what opens the door to the gospel. It says in James 1, 21, 22, it says, receive with meekness or with humility the implanted word which is able to save you. Okay, humility. Humility, we'll define it in just a minute. I'll have the Lord define it for you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news. Now, I don't know why these translators always put the word poor there. And it really bothers me because it's translated in children's Bibles, poor. Jesus blesses the poor. And my little granddaughter had one of those Bibles. I thought, I need to call those people. It's not the word poor. It's the word, and I'm not a scholar, but I can at least go back to the Greek and Hebrew. And it's the word anav, A-N-A-V. It means humility. So I'm going to read it correctly. And uh, that is, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the humble. That's what it means, to the humble. Sometimes they use the word meek, which is good, but humility is, is more defined in Scripture. When it says that Moses was the meekest man, in fact, it says Moses was very anav. Moses was very humble, the most humble man on the earth, Numbers 12, 3. And so humility, if you want to be used in supernatural signs and wonders, you need to have be, uh, you know, saved like Moses got saved. You need to be in the wilderness for 40 years and then he'll use you, you know. But uh, Moses was humbled in that wilderness experience and that's what we have to embrace in the wilderness, these seasons that we have. We follow the ancient paths in scripture. So it says here that the, bring the good news to the poor. That's who it's sent. It's sent to, the, to those who are not poor at all, it, although he chooses the poor of the earth, rich in faith. But that word is a bad translation, and those guys should will all be repenting when they go before the Lord. I'll tell you that. And uh, I don't like it when it has a children's Bible that uses their translations. I don't like it. My little granddaughter, no, it doesn't mean that. Don't worry. It doesn't mean you have to be poor. And uh, can you imagine that? So anyway, I wanted to uh, uh, tell you about that. And then I want to go to um, Matthew 11. 28, 30, extremely uh, famous, well-known verses. How do you get humility? Um, you obey this verse. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you. And he always, in other words, when you're having a bad day, you know, <laughs> this is my translation, you know, come to me, all of you, when you're just kind of ticked off and don't know if I really exist anymore and you're carrying your heavy burdens, you know, and he says, I'll give you rest. Okay, great. 
And he says now, uh, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble. In fact, that's not a good translation either. It says, he actually says, come and learn of me. Come and learn of me because I am humble. He's going to teach them that he's humble. That translation you can tell is not that good. But it's actually, he's saying, come and learn about me and partake of me. And let me impart to you my humility. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Partakers of the divine nature. Escaping all the corruptions in the world through evil desire. Second Peter, you know, chapter 1. No, just go back to verse 29. That's really the one I want. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Let me teach you, but learn from me is a better, I think, understanding. And, and learn what? Learn from me what? I want you to learn that I'm kind and I'm gentle. That's what Jesus wants you to know. When you come to him, you come to him and you're not always, you're a little bit weary, you're a little bit heavy laden, you're not too upset, you're a little, blah, blah, blah. and you wait on him and over a period of time, as the Holy Spirit gives you access, connects your spirit to his spirit, to the spirit of God, and you begin to partake of him directly, okay? I'm humble. I want you to learn that I am humble and I'm lowly in heart. I've used this illustration several times before, and uh, I, I forgot to receive the offering, right? Did we receive it? Receive it? Huh? Uh, every week, my wife says. <laughs> Doesn't mean I don't uh, think it's important. So, Lord, thank you for the free will offering of the people, and let these awesome, incredible ushers come forward now. Amen. Amen. So anyway, um, I use this illustration because uh, it's, I think it's a good one. I hope it's good. Anyway, it's like if you work for a huge corporation, those of you that have heard me, I'll t make it short. But if you work for a huge corporation and sometime the owner and the boss, uh, the CEO and the owner, calls you into his office and he looks at you and he says, and you're thinking, oh my God. <laughs> I just want you to learn about me. I want to teach you everything I know by you becoming like me. That's what's happening. That's to every one of you. That's to every one of you. Come and learn of my humility by me imparting it to you personally. I'm preaching Christ. I'm preaching the Lamb of God. Come and feed on him. Amen? So now we'll switch over to love. And I want to go, this is really beautiful because they've been able to do this. I sent it to them. But let's go to, uh, we're going to read. In fact, I'll read it. You, were you able to get that up working? Okay, we're going to read um, Second, Chronic, Second Corinthians 5.14. And uh, I want to, I'll, I'll just start reading it slowly till they get it up there. I took a picture of it. Now listen, this is the Kenneth S. Wiest translation. And I love this man. He uh, really helps me. Uh, for um, well, 2 Corinthians 5.14. Okay. Uh, let's see if we got that. So maybe it starts out. Yeah, that's where it starts out. I want to get a little bit further. Whether we are out of our mind, it was respect. Whether we are sober, is for, it is with respect to you. It should be, start out with for the, for the love. Okay. Hallelujah. That would have been hard to explain. <laughs> I know that verse, but I'm not teaching it. For the love which Christ has for me presses on me from all sides. Now listen, Paul is talking about what it's really like, not doctrinally, but experientially, to be in Christ. You step into Christ as a person who's saved and gets born again. And when you step into the Lord, you step into him as a seed becoming a new creation in him. And Paul is saying that Christ is being formed in him and he is partaking of the love of God. And the love of God is causing him to come to this highest purpose. I'm not going to live for myself, I'm going to live for him. This is how Christ in you, the hope of glory, is formed. And it's how Galatians 2.20 ain't no doctrine, but a reality. It's no longer I who live, but Christ, right? For the love which Christ has for me presses me on all, from all sides, holding me to one end. What is that? You'll find out. Prohibiting me from considering any other. Wrapping itself around me in tenderness, giving me an impelling motive. To do what, Paul? Having the... Uh, having brought me to this conclusion, what is it, Paul? Namely, that the one who died on behalf of all, therefore all died. Here it is. And that he also died 
on behalf of all, therefore all died, in order that those who are living no longer are living for themselves. That's the purpose. That we're no longer living for ourselves, but for the one who died on their behalf and instead of them was raised. Now listen carefully. That's actually the proper translation. I'll tell you why. Because I read that so many times over the years and I knew the Holy Spirit was saying, they're not translating this correctly. Listen carefully. The agape love of God is self-sacrificial. Is that true? And when we, and Paul came to it, he came to the fullness of the new creation state. He was dead and Christ was living in him and through him. Paul was still alive, but everybody will accept Galatians 2.20. You, know, uh, uh, you know, it's no longer I, it's Christ. It's no longer I, it's Christ. Paul was saying the same thing here. The love of Christ has got me to a point where I can... He was not confessing this as a faith thing. He was saying, I no longer... And listen to the... Study the life of Paul. It was unbelievable. They'd curse him. He'd go into churches and they'd say he was not this and that and that. He'd just say, the more I love you, the less I'm loved. I mean, he was overwhelmingly now exhibiting the very nature of Jesus Christ. He bore the name maybe greater than any human being has ever done on this earth. Peter and some of them, maybe unknown people that we don't know, but we have Paul. And he says, I've come to this one conclusion. The love of Christ is compelling me to what? Give up on being self-centered in any area of my life so that Christ himself can be, as it were, resurrection life inside of me. Christ in me, the hope of glory, has taken over. I'm, I'm his promised land and he destroyed all my giants and now he lives, not I, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. How did it happen, Paul? I was humble and the love of God began to break me and made me like a soft piece of clay and he molded me and I came to this ultimate conclusion. What a waste it is for me to live for myself. I came to this conclusion because the love of God, the love of Christ compelled me. No longer going to live for myself. Sounds good. But the love of Christ then began to be the change agent. Not him trying. Not trying it again. The love of Christ took, began to take over in the Apostle Paul. And he was transformed by the love of God. And he was able to say, Christ is living. Galatians 2.20 I no longer live. Christ now lives within me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. I'm telling you two things today. Jenny's going to come up in a minute. I'm telling you two things today. Humility is the, go the gospel is only for the humble. Oh, and I didn't define humility. I want to go back to, you got that verse. I want to go back to Matthew 18, 3 and 4. Jesus defines humility. Are you ready? By childlike faith. By childlike faith. I was raised in the faith message, you know, during the 70s and, uh, and so forth. But Jesus, the word, the word of God, the Bible, taught me what real faith really is. It's coming like a child to him and saying, I can't, but you can. So Jesus teaches, here's where Jesus defines humility. And, that, and this is what Jesus exhibited. He said, I only do what I see my father do. That was humility. He was totally dependent on the father. They asked him, who's the greatest? He says, I tell you the truth. Unless you turn away from your sins and become like little children, unless you turn away from your sins and become like little children, let's read that out, the next part out loud. What does it say that like little children, you will what? You will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, that verse is extremely important. Without humility, you're not getting into the kingdom of God. Well, pastor, no, forget it. I'm going with this. I'm going with thus saith the Lord. And I'm just telling you because you're humble, precious people. I'm not preaching again. You know, I'd have rocks coming back at me, not physically. I can feel when people think that I'm being, you know, like this or that. But you're meek and tenderhearted people. But you need to tell some of your friends. There's a lot of lukewarm Christians out there that have stopped going to church. You with me? I ran into some the other day. I did a funeral for a guy in I first church and found one of my couples there that we married 31 years ago. They said they hadn't been going to church. I said, what do you mean you're not going to church? You know, come to our church. I told, well, I don't, I don't usually tell that to people, but I, they know me for 31 years. 
I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says, you know, you should come and learn about me. I will teach you myself personally. And then the gospel opens up and the word of God produces in you me. I'm the living word. Got it? The love of God will eventually compel you to stop living a self-centered life. Only the love of God. I can preach it. I can say you need to repent. You need to do this. That's all works. You need to repent. But you need to go to Jesus and let his righteousness help you repent. Don't do anything alone. Without him, I can do nothing. Amen? So Jenny, come on up. Praise the Lord. I'm... Uh, I, what did I do? I preached 15 minutes or so. <laughs> so. And then after Jenny comes, uh, she's going to teach about 15 minutes or so. And then we're going to have Keith and Raylene come up because yesterday when we were praying, I said to uh, Keith, I asked him to do a father blessing. Then Raylene's yeah. right there. I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. So anyway, they, they got a hold of me last night and they're going to bless you with a mother and father blessing. Just to let you know we love you. <laughs> and, and they're anointed to do it. You know, so that we saved the best for last, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, Jenny's coming up. She's one of our elders. We love her, and you'll be Thank greatly you. blessed by her. So you'll use that. Is that okay? Using, oh, you got it. Yeah. Oh, you're awesome. Yeah. Great. All right. Praise Hello, the Lord. everyone. I hope I wasn't so too good tough. To see Was you. I too tough? No. Okay, great. All right. Oh, okay, great. Thank All you. All right. Well, a few words with you today. There's a bit of an overlap, which is always interesting, both with uh, Pastor Rick and also with the worship. So I believe the Lord has something for you personally, and that's what I'm standing in today. As we look to him, for this has been quite a journey, hasn't it? And that's what I'm going to speak on today, about the journey of love. And yet, it's a journey maybe we never, ever would have suspected. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that in you we move and have our being. We stand here today saying we have such need of you, for without you we are nothing. And yet in you we can be all things that you have designed. Help us today as your spirit comes and moves freely in our midst. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, something that impacted me last week during the worship that we had on Valentine's Day was I saw behind us here, there was an opening that came almost like a lava-like material, gold and reddish. And I thought, Lord, what are you doing? What is coming into this congregation? And then I was also reminded that at that time that that I felt like God was trying to say something, like he was messaging us in a new, in a different way. And of course, the topic we know was in many ways about the love of God. And Pam, if you have not listened to that message last week, you must listen to that message. And so I'm mindful of that message today, and yet it, it kind of starts in a unique way. Listen to this story. I too went on a walk this past week, and as I went down the way and, uh, and took this walk, I noticed something was kind of interesting, because I'm always saying, Lord, are you trying to speak to us today? And I noticed this young man putting up this flag on the front of his house, and it was a flag that had NASA on it, and I thought, Lord? What is this? Is, did something happen with NASA today? And so I was mindful of that scripture that many of us know. Let me read it to you. It says this, and it was spoken about by Pastor Pam earlier in a way. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the works of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. When I went home and I discovered, oh my gosh, there's a news flash. There's been a landing on Mars. 
And it just so happens, in case you didn't know, that the mission control is here in Pasadena, California. And these are the words that were spoken. Perseverance has landed. And I thought, Lord, I think you're trying to pour forth speech. You're trying to say something. And so it is a reminder of perseverance. So many of us have walked that walk of perseverance. Many of us know the definition, but let me remind you. Perseverance in doing something despite difficulty or delay. And yet, what have we had to persevere with or about? Well, many of us know, not just recently, during the election cycle and other times, but there has been a series of shakings that have gone on in our lives over these past years. For some, maybe greater than others. I remember a time when I was gathering with some leaders and we were praying and this leader next to me said, you know, I think I have a word for you. And I said, oh, really? Well, what is the word? And they said, well, I just see this this big, bold print. And I said, well, what does it say? What, What did you see? And this person said, stripped for the kingdom. Stripped for the kingdom. And many of us here in this place have gone through that. We've had to lay things down. Sometimes never knowing the price that would be paid. And so there are different shakings that have happened. Many of us know the shakings that we've had. Some of it's financial, job-related, identity-related, relationship-related. I mean, we could just keep going on that list, right? And yet the question is, is there purpose, is there fruitfulness to do with that required persevering during these times? And I would say yes, yes, and amen. Listen to these words of Paul when he says this. We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, in some places it says proven character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so there has been a intended training through persevering the shakings that we have gone through. The hand of God has been upon us, even though there has been, yes, warfare. And yet what has it done for you and me to do with love? It's created such a dependency on the Lord that we may see him and know him in dimensions we never would have imagined. And as I said, though, sometimes we need to take account and realize that there have been battles in our midst. And many of us, it's been internal battles. And for some, it's really been the battle over love. Will we receive the fullness of his love for us? For others, the battles have been in many other areas, security, lies that we have taken in, the double-mindedness or doubt that maybe has hit us, the isolation, the sin, our sense of value. And yet all along, I believe God has been pulling up the roots, the roots that needed to be pulled up so that his root of his love could take hold. And so we're mindful today that in the scripture that many of us know so well, it says, you know, we have also battled a sense of separation from God. Some of us don't even know that that's what's been happening. God has been at a distance in some ways from his love in ways that we just didn't even know. And yet I believe it is time to take authority in areas so that the separation that has hit us will not stand. Listen to these words of Paul, chapter 8. Who shall separate us? Who shall separate us 
from the love of Christ. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. It goes on, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor neither angels or demons, neither present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from him, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And some way ask, well, why such the need for love? Why is he reinforcing this? I distinctly felt after Pastor Pam spoke last week, the love of God needed to be reinforced in a different way. Why is this so important? For we're called as part of the command of the Lord, the foremost command, we are to love from a full heart and all our mind and all our soul. But if we're bound in some area, it's really not the fullness of heart, is it? And so I believe God is wanting us to close doors of our heart maybe has been divided or separated or shut down in some way. We function well in one area, but maybe just not other areas. And so God, I believe, is waking us, waking us. We talk about the awakening, but the awakening really is in us as it goes across the nation. And I believe it's so important, the love of God is like an oil. It's like an oil for the gears that we need to function with. It acts like a protective factor. I felt like the Lord reminded me. It's like an immunity, a protection from sickness, from disease, from infection that may try to come into our own heart. And I'm reminded also that there's a settling then of our heart. It's a warfare issue. Not just for the past battles we've known, but the future battles that are yet to come. The Lord says we're to close every door that needs to be closed and open every door that he has for us. But I believe it begins in our hearts. Love is such a key. Listen to these words from Pastor Pam. I thought this was so important. It says this. She says this. It's only those in love who will finish the race. It's only love, being in love, that will hold us, tasting of love. So this isn't just about today. This is about our future, where we are going as a people, as a church. It's so important, the love of God. And so as we have tasted of love, as Pam talked about and how crucial that is, I believe we have tasted of battles and the shakings, yes. Yet we've also tasted of perseverance. Our characters have had a chance to be strengthened during this time. It's redemptive. God has a redeeming thing for his people. And as we have tasted of love, I believe as his love is ongoing, being worked in us, the flow of love is increasing I believe we're also going to taste of enlargement enlargement and in our enlargement I believe we will taste of his power I invite you to listen to these words it's a really a prayer many of us know this prayer and yet it is such a, an amazing prayer of Paul when he says in Ephesians 3, he says, So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father and child in heaven and on earth. And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Then by constantly using your faith 
the life of Christ will be released deep inside of you. And the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Then you will experience, you will be, excuse me, you will be empowered to discover what every holy one experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions, and deeply, how deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love, how enduring and inclusive it is, endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. We must go there. It transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. And so I believe a couple highlights. I feel like God is wanting to so deeply root himself, his love in us. For there are many dimensions and Pam brought out, incredible, the foundation, the grounding that is so needed. Because in him is understanding, affirmation, acceptance, the fullness of knowing who he's made. We have access anytime to go to him. And so love, it is important that it is grounded we're reminded that it has been demonstrated. Christ demonstrated his love. And each of us are examples of demonstrating to others. There's the testing of love. How will we stand in given situations? As things get tougher, perhaps, as the days go on. And so in us, there's also the perfecting of love. Where well, those little rough edges, right? get removed. We all have them in different ways. And yet there's also the discovery of the language of God's love to us. It's a little different maybe for each of us, right? How he makes sure he gets that to us. Revealing even the longings. The word says even in Romans that the groanings that are too deep, it's a work of the Spirit. And yet, finally, there's a reminder of the expression of love. And we become those people that God will use. For I believe in the days ahead, there's going to be displays of the love of God, the power of God like we've never seen. Now, as I was waiting on the Lord this morning, I, I, I just had this sense, oh my gosh, it's, I see these horses, they're getting ready, getting ready, getting ready to launch, to go, to go, to go. And some may say the horses represent leaders. Well, I'm sure everyone, just about everyone in this room is a type of a leader, a person of influence in your particular area. So praise God that he, as Rick, Pastor Rick said, love will compel us to go and to do who he's called us to do. But we first must receive knowing that his perseverance through the shakings will lead to that refined character. And that refined character, of course, will lead us to places we've never expected. The width, the depth, and the height of his love worked in us will then help us, really, to reach the world. Because the reminder is, as we receive from him, then we become his messengers wherever we go. But we're watered messengers. We're living messengers. We haven't fallen by the wayside. This is my last point. I believe that as in preparing for this time, I really felt not only that enlargement I spoke of that's happening, but it's an enlargement in ways that we can't even imagine, an enlargement to do even with the increase of the spiritual senses, exactly what Pastor Pam mentioned. And as we're enlarged before him, can you imagine what that will look like to the rest of the world? 
because it's one thing to not only love God, to love ourself, to love our neighbor, but what about when the love of God is released to love even our enemies? So get ready. We're about to go ways that we've never gone before. Isn't that a Star Trek thing? Anyway. <laughs> But it gets back to the fact that the Lord is speaking. Amen. Oh, thank you. Even Raylene, do you need me to announce you? <laughs> They're going, what's that? Oh, no, he's coming. He, I thought he was looking for his wife, but come on up. You'll, you'll do, right? <laughs> okay. What did you guys, you know what to do. You're the sound man, so. Do you need anything else? Just, you're just going to use that? Okay, great. Here they are. They're also our elders here as well. Amen. All right. I invite you to close your eyes and receive. It seems like... The father figure has been attacked from many angles of our culture. In the Old Testament, the father figure pronounced a blessing over their children. Today, not so much. Even either the father hasn't been present or, have, or having the knowledge to do so. To you, I would offer to um, get a little ringing here. Uh, to you, I would like to offer the blessings of the Heavenly Father through myself, an earthly father. This type of blessing is seen in number six, as God blessed the children of Israel under the pronouncement of Moses. It goes on to say that upon blessing the people, God would place his name and bless those who heard it. This means you. Therefore, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And from me, from my heart, as a father, as a grandfather, I would like to bless your spirit in a way that our Heavenly Father's heart is so passionate to see our full identity as sons. He calls our spirit to life, to possess fully the due sonship. Sonship. Sonship is received in our spirit and works on our heart and soul to receive and to release us from sin and the flesh and to bring recovery from wounding. It also propels us forward into the potential that God wrote in his book for us. I speak to your spirit, people of God, and call your spirit to attention in the name of Jesus. Listen with your spirit to God's word. You formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside, and wove it all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It's, it, simple, it simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place, skillfully, carefully, you shaped 
me from nothing to something. You saw who you created me to be before I became me, before I'd ever see the, the light of day. The number of days you planned for me are already recorded in your book. So I bless you to see the purpose of which you were created, depositing the essence of God's love in the world around you. To have courage above your peers, not allowing fear, doubt, unbelief to interfere, believing that you can do all things through Christ. To have more passion for the things of God, to dream more about others, more than others think that is practical and seeing those dreams to come true. To expect more than others think is possible, expecting to do miracles through you. I bless you to have a strong discernment, able to guide you and guide your soul through the troubled waters. You have people to influence that you have not met yet. You have lives to change that are waiting for your arrival. You are, you are strategically placed wherever God takes you by his grand design just so that you could become everything that he made you to be. That place is the place that you grow best. The place is the place where you can be most fruitful. The place where, you're, where the future is changed because of your presence. And I bless the parents of the young children to build in them a strong foundation of God's love and that they may grow to become giants in faith in the mighty hand of God. You won't fail. You were made by God to be here in such a time as this. And I bless your spirits in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm a mother and a grandmother. And a mother encourages and exhorts. So I just invite you to close your eyes today as I bless you with this. Daughters and sons of the Most High God, I call your spirit to attention. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood a holy nation, his own special people. You are his workmanship. You are accepted in the beloved, and you are far more valuable than you can ever imagine. Knowing your worth is not by any means a call to arrogance or pride. It is a humble, quiet, yet confident awareness of your value in God's eyes and in the eyes of others. I bless you to commit all that you do into God's hands, trusting him to wisely lead you in every step. I bless you to know your worth that will sustain you in an attitude of thankfulness, gratitude, and praise, and to always stay motivated to improve in every area to the glory of God. I bless you with knowing that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in you. 
I bless you with the cleansing power of Jesus to erase all wounds and bring you back to his original intent, to his garden. I bless you with childlike wonder to take his hand and walk with him and talk with him in the garden in the cool of the day. Great adventures await you. I bless you with the knowledge that now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Awake, arise and shine. Open your eyes, it's time to shine. Revive, revive, revive. It's your hour. There is a mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to you, his saints, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I bless you with the revelation knowledge that you are a people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been. A fire devours before you, and behind you a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before you, and behind you a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape you. Be glad and rejoice, O worthy one, for the Lord is waiting to do miracles through you. Amen. Amen. It just, it just came to me, and I'm going to do this myself, but I'm going to ask our Heavenly Father to help my heart receive more of the love of God. So you can just do that. I'm going to pray it myself right now. Heavenly Father, my heart wants to receive more of your love, and I ask you to help me to be aware of it, Help me be aware of whatever hinders me from receiving it more and giving it more to others. So I thank you for this day, Lord, for uh, us to be still and know that you're God, to know that you are perfect and holy love. And may a greater revelation of truly the knowledge of God be among us in these coming days. The greatest thing in the world is to grow in the knowledge of God. And I pray for that. I'll close with um, Colossians 1, 9 through 11. I pray that we might increase in the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we can walk worthy of you, Lord, pleasing you in all things, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God and strengthened with all manner of power and long suffering, joyfully giving thanks unto the Father who has made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints who walk in the light. In Jesus' name. I also want to pray a prayer for those who are watching online or may be here today. I say always the same thing. The greatest decision you'll ever make in this world is what are you going to do about Jesus Christ? He said he came down from heaven. He said he was the savior of the world. He said before Abraham was, I am. And they crucified him for being who he is and who he is now. And he's the only savior in the world, the only one you'll ever have. And I pray that you ask him to make himself real. That you bow your head and be humble. And you can have eternal life through him and him alone. So, Lord, I pray for people watching that they, too, can partake. It's for everybody. The whole world is made by you, Father. The whole universe. And you love people. That's the bottom line. I pray for your blessing upon people in Jesus' name. Draw them all, Lord, just like you drew us. Amen. Bless you. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Thank you. We love you, God. The Gathering Place.